Okay. Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to the uh, our grand rounds here at the Osher Center for Integrative Medicine here at Brigham Women's Hospital and Harvard Medical School. And Matt, I would like to um, introduce our speaker. Um, uh, I actually had the pre you know, uh, just the pleasure of knowing Franklin as a resident, uh, but now he's really emerged into this, uh, um, really on the cutting edge. Um, Franklin Kling is an instructor in psychiatry here at Harvard Medical School. He's the director of education and therapist training and is based at the um, Center for the Neuroscience of Psychedelics, which is based out of the Department of Psychiatry at Massachusetts General Hospital. Uh, and this is, as you can imagine, a topic that is of interest to so many people. Uh, it is such a, an important topic for, uh, for the dialogue, uh, especially as we think about innovations in, in, uh, in mental health care. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Franklin. Um, and uh, again, um, uh, if you are requesting CME credit, uh, the details will be in the chat uh, as to how to just send a quick email to Esme uh, about uh, getting credit. So uh, at Franklin, I'll turn it over to you. Thanks so much for the intro and uh, thank everyone for, for coming. Hopefully this will uh, be a stimulating talk and leave some time uh, for some discussion at the end. Um, so um, I'll just say by way of additional introduction, this is an area I've been interested in for a very long time. And there's a lot of exciting things happening, not just at MGH, but also in the Boston area. We refer back a little bit to that at the end of the talk. Just for disclosures, I own personal stock in Compass and Cybin. I'm not going to be talking about the work of those companies today. Um, instead, let me just move the Zoom thing out of the way. There we go. So just the outline of the talk, initially going to set the stage a little bit cynically as to why we have a need to be having this conversation in the first place, then dive into some definitions, go through some of the trials, relevant studies, talk a little bit on mechanisms, I'm going to focus a little bit on how psychedelics might be complementary to meditation, which is a really interesting and emerging topic. And then some of the challenges to uh, getting these things over the finish line and some of the ethical issues. So this for starters, why are we actually talking about this? Well, we're really talking about this because there's so much excitement with psychedelics. And the reason there's so much excitement uh, in part with psychedelics is that uh, the treatments available in contemporary psychiatry are failing a large number of, of patients. And despite that, uh, despite uh, increasing prescription rates, depression uh, rates continue to increase, suicides continue to increase, particularly some of these statistics are pre-pandemic, they've all accelerated, um, drug overdoses are increasing, and antidepressants and anti-anxiety medications have been uh, increasing in age groups, particularly over the last few years in younger patients. And so really despite all of this, this is kind of the, the downer part of the talk, um, despite more and more resources being devoted to this, there's still these huge proportions of patients in all of our disorders that really are not being touched by available treatments. And this is really one of the reasons that I became so interested in this. I came of age in uh, medical school and psychiatry residency, really kind of a few years after the tail end of this long wave of drug development. So the people that were teaching me in medical school and mentoring me in residency came of age in a different time when SNRIs and SSRIs and atypical antipsychotics were all coming out year after year. There was a lot of hope that psychopharmacology was really going to revolutionize psychiatry. And for many patients, it did. But for many patients, treatment resistance remains a really difficult issue. And so now we sort of have on the other side of this kind of cynical coin, this over exuberance uh, towards psychedelics. So the other reason we're having this talk is there's a lot of hype. There's a lot of interest in psychedelics, tons of money being invested into it. People are talking things like a paradigm shift, whatever that might mean. And I think it's important to sort of take a measured approach and really look at what these things are, what they might do and how they could be used uh, safely, equitably, and how we could actually make them most effective in psychiatry and for other purposes. So just starting off, what do psychedelics actually do? So we don't actually have a universally accepted definition of what psychedelic means, but I like to think of psychedelics as uh, molecules that elicit a profound shift in consciousness. They bring people into a non-ordinary state of consciousness. And that is often experienced by the person taking them as deeply personally important or having a lot of spiritual meaning. 
oftentimes a sort of transpersonal experience will ensue and that's called ego dissolution. We'll talk more on that later. A sense of increased connectedness is commonly felt as well as an enriched sensory and overall phenomenal experience. And this sensory stuff I put down here lower on purpose because I think the media aspects uh, of psychedelics, if you watch movies and learn about psychedelics from uh, the media, you would probably think of psychedelics as being more like uh, drugs that cause a hyperactive delirium where you see people hallucinating and following hallucinations. And this is really not how psychedelics work. One of the most interesting things about psychedelics, uh, and we'll get about this later, is that the changes appear to be durable over time. So they work, uh, they elicit a change, and then that change is sustained. So what are the psychedelics? I'm not going to be talking about ketamine. <clears throat> That's sort of its own class. I'm going to be talking about these two groups, the tryptamines and then the phenethylamines. So the tryptamines are by far the largest group of psychedelics that have been studied. And those include sort of all the heavyweights like LSD, psilocybin, DMT, as well as 5-MeO-DMT, which is at least at this point a little bit more obscure. Um, all tryptamines are based on the structural backbone of serotonin, which is actually 5-hydroxytryptamine. It is itself a tryptamine. So I've circled the tryptamine core there. These are just three different images of the molecule of LSD. <clears throat> and if you look here on the upper right, you'll see serotonin. <clears throat> Excuse me. And then on the lower left, you'll see psilocybin, which is actually a prodrug for psilocin, but you can look at all of these compounds and see they all share this, uh, this tryptamine or indolamine core, okay? Now, phenethylamines uh, are a widely studied and widely applied group within medicine, and they comprise a number of different agents that are used commonly, as well as the neurotransmitters, epinephrine, norepinephrine, and dopamine. <clears throat> but there are also psychedelic phenethylamines, and those include mescaline, which many people have probably heard of. That comes from the peyote cactus, but much more studied than mescaline is actually MDMA. That's actually the only methylamine that's really been heavily studied. So it's this whole other class um, of psychedelics with potential applications that really we don't have a lot of research on at this point. The primary pharmacological mechanism by which psychedelics work is through the 5-HT2A receptors. So they're agonists at the serotonin 2A receptor. And this has been shown in a number of studies where they have given participants ketanserin, which is a blocker of the 5-HT2A receptor, followed by psilocybin or LSD or other psychedelics. And so this is just one study. This was a study conducted in Switzerland using LSD. The y-axis is a quantification of the psychedelic experience. So you can see the purple line are the participants who are given LSD and then superimposed upon each other are two essentially identical lines, one being the participants that were given placebo the other being the participants that were given ketanserin, which completely blockades the effect of LSD when it was given afterwards. In terms of physiological effects and sort of medical safety when conducting research with these compounds, they actually are pretty medically well tolerated. And so a little less than half of participants across different studies, these are mostly based on psilocybin and LSD trials, will report headache, nausea, or fatigue. These tend to not be significant experiences limiting the therapeutic effects. They do reliably um, increase sympathetic discharge. And so um, psychedelics will increase uh, blood pressure, heart rate, and temperature. These changes are very mild. I'll show you on the next slide. But generally, we're talking about 10 millimeters of mercury systolic and diastolic blood pressure. 10 beats per minute of heart rate, very subtle increase in temperature. For, so for most uh, participants and future patients, this is going to be clinically significant, but not all patients. This is, this is um, something to, to know about. There has been a number of trials that have been conducted in medically ill subjects. So people um, with heart failure and uh, particularly with terminal cancer, as well as some preliminary work with geriatric patients. And so in these populations so far, it seems that psychedelics have been medically actually quite well tolerated. What's interesting is that we actually don't even have an LD50, which is the lethal dose to kill 50% of the persons who would take such a dose for humans. They have that, they've done it um, for rodents and projected that for humans, likely uh, LSD, which is dosed in micrograms, that the lethal dose would probably be somewhere in the grams for psilocybin, which is 25 milligrams, the usual dose of psilocybin, that it would take kilograms of psilocybin uh, to be lethal. There's no evidence for mutagenic effects or neurotoxicity. Um, this is a vestige of uh, drug propaganda campaigns from the 1960s and 1970s, not based on science. These are just a couple of studies. On the left here, you're seeing this sort of reliable increase 
of about 10 millimeters of mercury of blood pressure, both systolic and diastolic. And over here on the right um, is a study conducted with LSD. They're using escalating doses, and you can see that these changes, um, both in blood pressure and then also heart rate and temperature, are also dose dependent. And uh, the black triangles upside down are uh, people that were given ketanserin first. So essentially they did not actually uh, have the effect. So the autonomic effects are also contingent on the 5-HT2A receptor as well. Now what's interesting about psychedelics is this uh, idea of tachyphylaxis. So tachyphylaxis refers to when a drug achieves a desired effect or an effect. And then after repeated administration, uh, this effect is no longer achieved. So this is a word that's often used in depression research because we know that a certain number of patients will have a response to SSRIs or SNRIs for a period of time, weeks, months, sometimes years, and then tachyphylaxis will ensue in which the antidepressant will just stop working. And so this is seen reliably in psychedelics much more quickly. So for most people, just a few days of daily administration of a psychedelic will result in a lack of any psychedelic effect being achieved. And there's cross tolerance between different agents. And so LSD for a few days followed by psilocybin would mean that the person would not be able to get an effect from psilocybin. It's thought based on animal models, this probably correlates with downregulation of postsynaptic 5-HT2A receptors. Um, while the mechanism is probably less important uh, clinically, um, the implications of this is that biological dependence on psychedelics is actually not possible. And so with daily administration of psychedelics, after a few days, the person can't get an effect, there needs to be a washout period um, and so people cannot actually become dependent uh, or addicted in, in the true sense to these, these compounds. Psychedelics are interesting uh, for many reasons, but one of them is that this, the, when designing a clinical research with psychedelics, really it's not medical safety so much as psychological safety that needs to be taken into account here. So these are powerful agents. They, reduce, they produce uh, really significant changes, bringing people into non-ordinary states of consciousness um, can often be experienced um, positively, but there are a number of challenging experiences that can come up in a session. And so these include things like anxiety, dysphoria, paranoia. Um, this can occur across a variety of different modalities. And so it can just be simple sensory experiences. People, people become very somatically preoccupied or have negative personal thoughts about themselves or ranging all the way up to sort of metaphysical concerns. In clinical settings, uh, you might think that this would be considered a psychological adverse effect, but really the whole idea behind psychedelic assisted psychotherapy is that all experiences are valuable, whether they're perceived to be pleasant or whether they're perceived to be challenging. And so the primary intervention is not really an intervention at all, it's interpersonal support. So the therapists are there in the room to help the patient, to talk the patient, sometimes uh, to help lead the patient in a breathing exercise or interpersonal grounding a hand on the shoulder or, or holding the patient's hand. But pharmacological rescue is not needed. Now, when designing a clinical trial with psychedelics, there's always gonna be a rescue drug like a benzo and sometimes a neuroleptic. But as far as I'm aware, these have never been used in any of the modern clinical trials. Um, really, people are just, they utilize the therapy to get the person through whatever the difficult experience might be. Screening is important. So while we don't know what the potential relationship might be with persons that might be at risk of developing psychosis or a, a manic episode, um, all modern clinical research has screened out anyone who has a personal history of any, any sort of psychotic episode, whether it's affective or non-affective. And a lot of institutions are a little bit more uh, cautious and screen out persons who have a primary relative who also has a psychotic disorder. HPPD refers to hallucinogen persistent perceptual disorder. This is uh, essentially the clinical term for flashbacks or sort of persisting intermittent, usually perceptual distortions. Um, this is widely reported, interestingly, in uh, sort of lay literature as well as case reports. It's never been seen in any modern clinical research. So the question is whether this is due to better screening um, or whether there's a mechanism that may be uh, not fully biological. So much more research needs to be done on this area. So just moving into uh, how these things are actually used in psychiatry. So when psychedelics first entered into modern medicine, mostly we're talking about LSD at this time, this was the 1950s. Psychiatry was dominated by psychoanalysis, and the idea initially, or the theory behind how LSD might be utilized, is that LSD 
was thought to reduce ego defenses. And because it was reducing ego defenses, it was thought that LSD could be useful in amplifying any sort of underlying psychodynamic processes or material that was going on in a previously existing or established psychotherapy. So in this model, which was called psycholytic psychotherapy, the psychedelic was used as an adjunct to therapy, not as an actual cure. The therapy was not structured around LSD. And essentially what they did is just took conventional psychodynamic psychotherapy or psychoanalysis, which would have been multiple visits per week over a period of one to two years, and 50 or so sessions would actually be LSD sessions. And they weren't high doses. They were using lower, moderate doses, essentially, again, to sort of reduce ego defenses and let the therapy move a little bit more, uh, more quickly. This became the dominant model on uh, both North America as well as Europe eventually kind of stayed the dominant model in Europe, but in the 1960s, the shift started focusing to be really more on the actual psychedelic. And this happened for a number of different reasons. So number one was the climate of the times was that Abraham Maslow at that point was the chair of the American Psychological Association. He wrote a really great book uh, called Peak Experiences, which I highly recommend anybody who's interested in this work. Um, Maslow really was sort of trying to shift focus back on the importance of the transcendent state as being an integral part of the human experience and something that itself could actually be healing. Alongside this, there were a number of researchers who were starting to notice that the benefits ascribed to psychedelics by patients or study participants were repeatedly being uh, conceived of as being because of the fact that the participants were having a spiritual experience or a mystical experience, the words sort of differ. And then that's led a number of different researchers to sort of start looking into more of the prehistorical and historical uses of psychedelics. And these were all sort of much more ritualized. And this came to evolve into essentially the form that's used today, which then was called psychedelic psychotherapy or peak therapy. And now is called psychedelic assisted psychotherapy. And what this utilized is the intentional use of suggestibility. So psychedelics, among other things, make people more suggestible under the influence of the psychedelic. And this was called upon, and there was a lot of ritual brought in. And the whole goal, rather than being uh, essentially taking a pre-existing therapy and throwing in a psychedelic to sort of catalyze the therapy itself, was to construct the therapy around a single or maybe two high dose sessions of a psychedelic. And so this became the model in the United States that was sort of prevailing in most uh, academic centers at the late 1960s when research was shut down. This is the model that's been resurrected over the last 20 years that with sort of slight variations is used across all of the studies that you've heard about uh, in the news and that I'll be referring to today. And the idea behind psychedelic assisted psychotherapy, again, is that the therapist is present, but this is, this is quite different from sort of a conventional treatment per se. The patient is encouraged to have an internal experience and to facilitate that, <clears throat> there's a lot of attention paid to the decor, to the setting, set and setting that you might've heard of. Also to facilitate that, usually there will be headphones with the playlist. So all of these uh, protocols uh, with the IRB actually have a playlist listed. Um, they'll be given eye shades. And so most of the time, this really isn't talking therapy, or at least it's not constructed as such. So the therapists are there to talk if uh, need be. But really, most of the communication between therapist and participant is before in the preparation sessions where they're sort of encouraged and prepared for the psychedelic uh, to approach the psychedelic content when they get there with openness and curiosity. And then the second place where there's a lot of talking is the integration. And so there will be a number of integration therapy sessions that come after the medicine visit. And that will be, again, not something where the therapist is interpreting things for the patient, but rather simply encouraging the patient to talk about whatever seems significant to them. Um, encourage them to sort of try to have, uh, try to utilize what came up to think about what it might mean for them. Um, but this is, again, this is not a prescriptive model. And so this, I think, this model is a little bit difficult um, in terms of how it might fit into the, the sort of conventional medical model, which tends to be more prescriptive. So now I'm just going to talk about a few of the studies that have been conducted with psychedelics. Um, I'm not going to talk about addictions because that's sort of a, a whole other area, but I'm going to talk a little bit about the mood disorders and for PTSD. 
And so these are the three studies that have used uh, psilocybin assisted psychotherapy. So sometimes it's AP, sometimes AT, um, assisted psychotherapy, assisted therapy for major depression. The first study was an open label study. Um, sample size is pretty small. All of these uh, worth noting are actually very small studies. So the first one, this was done uh, in Imperial College London. They did two psilocybin sessions. One was sort of a, a modest dose of psilocybin just to get the participants uh, acclimated to what uh, the psilocybin session was going to be like. <clears throat> and a week later, they came back, <coughs> excuse me, and gave them a higher dose psilocybin session. And then they followed their depression scores. These were people who had uh, treatment-resistant depression. And they followed them using the quids as their uh, measure at six months. And they found a rapid and a sustained reduction in depression scores uh, at the primary endpoint of six months, just following two psilocybin sessions. So this is kind of the typical thing that you'll see in a psychedelic study, this sort of rapid decrease that ends up being sustained over the long time. Uh, in 2020, this was a Johns Hopkins study. This was a randomized controlled trial. They used a weightless control model. Uh, that's the one that I'm showing on the upper right here. Enrolled a uh, total sample size of 27, split them into two groups. Uh, each one got two psilocybin sessions separated by about two weeks. And then they followed them eight weeks out to the Hamilton. And they found <clears throat> in this group that 54% showed remission at the primary endpoint. Um, and this was similar for both groups. So again, the weightless control model essentially means that they enrolled an immediate treatment group, gave them the psilocybin treatment while the other half was kept on a wait list. And then when the first arm of the study completed, they brought the people in off the wait list and gave them the same treatment. And then finally, in 2021, there was this study that compared two sessions of psilocybin-assisted psychotherapy with s citalopram so this one enrolled uh, almost 60 people, so there were about 30 in each arm. Uh, this was another study that was uh, published out of Imperial College London and appeared in the New England Journal of Medicine, I think, last April, so one year ago about. <clears throat> and the design for this study is that uh, participants were randomized to either receive psilocybin-assisted therapy essentially on day one, and then another session of psilocybin at week three, and then they followed them up uh, a total of six weeks after the study began. <clears throat> or uh, the other half were started on s citalopram 10 milligrams per day. They were given placebo therapy at the beginning and then came back three weeks later, got a placebo session of psilocybin-assisted psychotherapy. And then their uh, daily medication was increased to 20 milligrams of s citalopram So both groups were followed up at six weeks. The big news on this one, um, at least as far as the study reported, it was that s citalopram and psilocybin essentially showed identical efficacy in this study. Now, there were some secondary measures, including well-being, where the psilocybin group fared uh, superiorly. Um, but this is an interesting study. Unfortunately, I wish that they had followed the participants for longer because six weeks is not very long to keep someone on uh, an SSRI. So it's possible that there would have been more benefit uh, if the SSRI had been continued for longer, or it's possible that this was a placebo response. So nonetheless, this is the study that actually did a head-to-head -head comparison. So um, groundbreaking study here. Um, MDMA, just to take note of this, is a little bit different. MDMA doesn't actually work through agonist activity um, at the serotonin uh, 2A receptor. MDMA primarily works by releasing serotonin. It's sort of a serotonin releasing agent. And MDMA's effects tend to be a little bit less reliably inductive of a mystical experience so much as being a more pro-social compound. So it sort of reduces fear and increases empathy and trust um, when people are under the influence of MDMA. So this is, again, this is also a, one thing just to take note of in all of these studies that psychedelics do elicit a highly vulnerable state. And so there's gonna be a lot of ethical uh, parameters that are gonna need to be set up uh, once these things are uh, in a post-approval world. So we can come back to that at the end. Um, <clears throat> there's two major studies that have used MDMA for PTSD, or MDMA-AT is uh, the organization that's pursuing this calls it. So the first was a small study of just 26 uh, participants who had treatment-resistant PTSD, pretty severe CAPS, that's a clinician-administered cl clinician PTSD rating scale. Essentially, they were given two sessions of MDMA-assisted therapy, and they found um, that MDMA significantly reduced uh, CAPS scores in all of the participants who were given this treatment. Uh, 
then in 2021 in Nature, there was uh, the same group published a much larger study. Uh, this is the very first phase three clinical trial ever conducted with any psychedelic. They enrolled 90 participants with severe uh, PTSD, not treatment resistant. And they were given either three rounds of placebo with therapy or three rounds of MDMA assisted psychotherapy. And they found significant reductions in CAPS. Um, the same group is currently doing the second phase three clinical trial. If the results are comparable to this one, we're likely to see the FDA approve MDMA or rather MDMA assisted therapy as being the first psychedelic ever approved for treatment. And this may be as early as late 2023 next year. This is just showing on the left here, um, the separation of the two groups over time. And I included this thing on the right here. This isn't a, a human chromosome. Uh, this is actually a sort of, this is the model of therapy that they use, but it's sort of an exemplary model to put into perspective how psychedelic assisted psychotherapy actually works. So just taking a look at this, the orange bands represent preparation therapy sessions. And so what they got, they got three preparatory therapy sessions, each with two therapists in the room, followed by uh, the dark red are the MDMA sessions. And so they had one session, then they had three integration sessions, then another MDMA session, three more integration, one more MDMA and three more integrations. And so what you're seeing here, these are 12 preparatory plus integration sessions, each with two therapists plus three MDMA sessions, which are eight hours each with two therapists present. So this is a lot of clinical time. Um, and this is one of the issues sort of facing psychedelics that if they're approved, uh, how are these gonna be scaled? Um, and are there more creative ways that we could be working with these? But this is sort of a typical model, probably maybe a little bit more therapeutic support on the front end and the back end than some studies, but this is sort of the usual uh, model of how psychedelic assisted therapy works. Lastly, this is an area um, of particular interest, uh, both to myself uh, as a CL psychiatrist, uh, as well as locally, because there uh, will be a study starting soon or may have already studied by um, some of my colleagues, uh, led by Yvonne Bossant at Dana-Farber Cancer Institute, um, looking at psilocybin assisted psychotherapy for end of life depression and anxiety in a hospice setting. And so this builds on a rich tradition of research that initially was probably one of the most, if not the most promising areas in the late 1960s of using psychedelics to help people deal with existential distress who were uh, facing terminal illness. This work itself came out of some clinical trials that had been done by a man named Eric Kast, who was uh, studying LSD initially as a potential analgesic and comparing it to morphine. But what he found was not only was LSD reducing pain in these patients, but that the patients started reporting that it wasn't so much an analgesic effect as the fact that they were having spiritual or transcendent experiences. And that those people who really were having those experiences were the ones who were both having reduced pain as well as improved mental well being and reduced death anxiety. And so there's a lot of work sort of moving forward before it was shut down at the end of the 1960s. This has been picked up in this millennium. And in 2016, a pair of randomized controlled trials, one from NYU by Ross, one from Hopkins by Griffiths, uh, what they did is they did uh, randomized crossover design. And so everybody in the study ended up getting psilocybin. And in both groups, they enrolled uh, participants who were facing uh, terminal cancer and were having depressive disorders or anxiety disorders um, in association with this. And everybody got uh, one session of psilocybin-assisted psychotherapy, and then their primary outcome was six months after this. And they found 60 to 80 percent reductions at six months following the psilocybin session. So this this is a pair of studies that really got everybody's attention. Um, Paul Summergrad, uh, who was then head of the APA, wrote a nice little uh, summary of these two, sort of a mini review for those that are interested in just a sort of short paper detailing these two studies. And Interesting, and this is sort of consistent with a number of psychedelic studies, the degree of improvement uh, of the patients in both of these was associated with the degree of uh, having a mystical experience. So the intensity of a mystical experience was positively correlated with the benefit. Um, in this study, one of the groups, the NYU group uh, published, I think last year in 2020, a 4.5 year follow-up of the survivors. 
um, you know, I think there were about a third of the people had survived, but um, 15 out of the 16 survivors agreed to be uh, interviewed and all had reported uh, ongoing benefit from uh, the psilocybin that they've been given uh, 4.5 years ago. So again, some, something happening that really seems to be durable. All right, so I've referred to the mystical experience uh, a few times. So you may be wondering what I'm talking about. So mystical experience, this is something that was defined um, and the definition itself has been criticized, but it was, it was defined um, in 1960 as sort of being made up of these attributes. The mystical experience defined as being both an experience of both internal and external unity, transcendence of time and space, ineffability and paradoxicality, a difficulty describing something in words, having a sense of sacredness or awe, this sort of noetic quality, this comes from William James, this sort of intuitive knowledge of ultimate reality, as well as deeply felt positive moods so of feelings of joy, peace, love and bliss. And so this is what actually defines the mystical experience. And there's a measure that it's used in most of these psychedelic studies that actually uh, charts the degree to which the psilocybin session or the psychedelic session facilitated a complete mystical experience. And so not just these cancer studies, but numerous studies for depression, for cancer, as well as studies in healthy participants have correlated the degree of mystical experience with whatever positive benefit uh, may have been achieved following psychedelic assisted therapy. It's one of the main lines of research at Johns Hopkins at their psychedelic center. These are just a few of their studies. On the left here, I said I wasn't going to talk about addictions, but this is uh, the negative correlation with cravings for nicotine um, in participants who were given psilocybin embedded in a CBT program for smoking cessation. And so the, the people um, who had less cravings were those who had achieved a higher degree of a mystical experience. Here in the middle, um, this was a study of a non-clinical sample of uh, participants, all who had a daily spiritual or religious practice. And you see this sort of increasing, um, there's a greater positive behavioral change that's directly associated with the percent of uh, participants who rated their session within uh, as being one of the top five most spiritual significant spiritually significant experiences in their lives. So spiritually significant being um, fairly well correlated with mystical experience. And then over here on the right, <clears throat> this is uh, the actual the Hopkins cancer study that I referred to. So these are anxiety scores. Again, uh, greater reduction in anxiety scores um, correlates with higher degree of mystical experience achieved. All right, so I wanted to uh, sort of sidetrack here and talk a little bit about the interrelationship, I think, between meditation and mindfulness uh, and psychedelics. Is this an area that I think is sort of ready um, for a lot of work? And indeed, there's, there's a number of studies that are ongoing right now um, that are examining this. So in terms of the relationship of sort of the ability to be mindful, um, there are scores that measure this. There's a couple of studies that are quite small, but um, these have found that psychedelics seem to increase the capacity for mindfulness. So this study here that I'm showing was very small, I think just eight participants, but they found that just given a regular program of psilocybin assisted psychotherapy without any intentional um, preparation or practice uh, in the direction of mindfulness led to increases in mindfulness capacity with an effect size that was similar to a program of MBSR, mindfulness-based stress reduction. This study here was an ayahuasca study where they uh, examined um, participants given ayahuasca. So the three um, the, the things here that we're looking at are some pre-ayahuasca, 24 hours of the next day afterwards. And then they followed them two months out. And all of the measures increased unsurprisingly 24 hours later. Um, the one that was persistent was the non-judging subscale of this five facets of mindfulness questionnaire. So these are really just the two studies that have looked at the capacity for mindfulness following the heels of uh, a psychedelic session. But there's a number of reasons to think that uh, mindfulness or meditation might be well complementary with a program of psychedelic assisted psychotherapy. So there's a couple of reasons for this. One is that it might enhance the dose of psychedelic assisted psychotherapy. The other being that psychedelics might enhance the dose of mindfulness or make people more able to get into a daily meditative practice. And both of these things have been studied, each with one, one trial so far. 
to just sort of put forth some of the ideas by which this might work, that psychedelics uh, might be benefited in terms of the preparation, that mindfulness could offer practice-based skills that could be used to help approach the content of psychedelic sessions with equanimity. So if you could potentially train people in mindfulness or meditation prior to a psychedelic session, this might actually lead to um, more benefit from the psychedelic as well as in terms of the integration sessions that it might provide a framework for making meaning of psychedelic experiences and for integrating insights. And so this has been studied by just a couple of groups so far, but there's gonna be a number of other projects I think we'll hear about in the next few years. This was a study where they took people who were actually experienced meditators, put them on a five-day mindfulness retreat, and at the end of the retreat, they gave them either psilocybin or placebo, and they encouraged them to meditate while they were on psilocybin. And what they found is that psilocybin, the uh, increased meditation depth and positively experienced ego dissolution without increased anxiety. So remember I said ego dissolution is this thing that sometimes can be experienced as challenging for people as they feel this sort of boundary between themselves and the rest of the world dissolving. This is one of the points at which there can be sort of difficulty or anxiety. And this is not what they saw in this group. They also found that the group that was given psilocybin had increased post-intervention mindfulness, greater increase in positive changes in psychosocial functioning. They also interviewed people, uh, family members and friends of these participants who also verified this, um, which was kind of neat. But the authors concluded that meditation appeared to be enhancing psilocybin's positive effects while counteracting potential dysphoric responses. That on the whole, the people in the study who were experienced meditators were able to make more out of the psilocybin session with less anxiety than some of their other studies. And that the positive responses at follow-up, interestingly, also correlated with the degree of ego dissolution achieved. This Johns Hopkins group uh, went at this uh, similar question kind of from the opposite direction. So what they did is they tried to create a meditation training program and then give the participants psilocybin. And so they had three groups, one was given a uh, sort of a light fair meditation training uh, along with placebo. And then the middle group was given a high dose of psilocybin. <clears throat> I think they were given, yeah, they were given two sessions of this over two months. Um, the second group was given a fairly light training in meditation. They called it spiritual practice, but it was mostly oriented at sort of daily contemplative practice as well as journaling. And then the third group was given a much more robust program that included both individual work, group work, um, a lot of uh, emphasis geared on sort of training for meditation and other contemplative practice. And so they wanted to see essentially what, what would happen um, if the group who was given more meditation training would actually do better from the psilocybin and whether the psilocybin itself would catalyze a more robust response and a more persistent uh, daily practice uh, using meditation. And they found this. So these are, these are the entities. I'm not going to go through all of these, but they found a number of changes in the participants who were given both high dose and high support, as they called it, the more robust program, than either the placebo group or the group that was given the same dose of psilocybin, but a much lighter, uh, flimsier uh, uh, contemplative practice training program. So more uh, positive changes, positive behavioral changes, increased spirituality. Um, and then this was another study where they interviewed uh, the, uh, the participants, family and friends who also would report on whether they perceived positive benefits, um, whether or not they knew what the study was about. Okay, so talking a little bit about mechanisms, you may be wondering how psychedelics work or why they might actually work. So the question, of why it's possible to actually have a psychedelic experience. Obviously, we don't know the answer to this, but one hypothesis that I find uh, intriguing and compelling is that offered by Robin Carrick Harris, which is based on work by uh, Kevin Mornane, who's the world expert in the serotonin 2A receptor. What Mornane has found is in animal models, at least, that the serotonin 2A receptor is implicated uh, in essentially turning on and becoming active when animals are, are put under a really significant stressor. So it turns on as a stress response. And so Carrot Harris's uh, hypothesis here is that 
this system may actually exist as a stress response, and it exists to induce a state of neuroplasticity that's necessary if an organism needs to sort of rapidly unlearn a lot of very deeply ingrained patterns of behavior, which in human beings, if you think of sort of more behavioral models of depression and anxiety, these are sort of very well ingrained patterns of thinking, right? And so the evolutionary uh, reason that we may actually have this capacity is as a stress response to sort of rapidly unlearn um, a lot of previously ingrained modes of behavior. And so that may be uh, why it's possible to achieve a psychedelic effect. We do know that 5-HT2A agonists promote neuroplasticity. What that means at the molecular level is that they increase the growth of dendritic spines on neurons, more synaptic proteins, more growth. Um, this is facilitated in part by BDNF, which is associated with neuroplasticity. We know that this effect is also blocked by ketanserin. That's the 5-HT2A receptor antagonist. And so it's thought also psychologically that this may be producing a window of neuroplasticity, which may be uh, sort of the neuroscientific reason why psychedelics induce this state of suggestibility. That it seems like whatever is experienced during the psychedelic session um, can actually become incorporated and lead to substantial change. So there's this window during which change is possible. No psychedelic talk would be complete without referring to the default mode network, which is a network of the brain. That means disparate parts of the brain that talk to each other but aren't anatomically contiguous. The default mode network is involved in daydreaming and mind wandering. It becomes less active, but it doesn't turn off during tasks that require uh, cognitive effort. The default mode network will turn on uh, when, uh, when retrieving autobiographical memory. And when thinking about the self, it's involved in self-referential processing. And this is one of the major things that is pathologically implicated in a number of different psychiatric disorders, particularly in rumination. So repetitive, negative self-referential thinking that we see not just in depression, but in a number of anxiety disorders and PTSD. Increased default mode network activity or abnormal activity is seen in craving and relapse and substance use disorders. It's associated with PTSD. It's associated with social anxiety disorder. So it's implicated across sort of transdiagnostically a number of different psychiatric conditions. And decreased default mode network activity, both the ability of the different parts of the network to talk to each other, as well as the integrity of the nodes themselves, has been shown with a number of different psychedelics, including psilocybin, ayahuasca, as well as LSD. And some evidence suggests that the magnitude of deactivation correlates with the experience of ego loss. So this experience of ego loss correlates with the magnitude of turning off this network that's involved in self-referential processing. So this is a really rich area for future research. I myself am not a neuroimager, but for those of you that are, there's a number of papers with great images. This is just one of them. Looking at 50 healthy volunteers, this is a Brazilian study. Um, who are ayahuasca naive. This is just showing the posterior cingulate cortex, which is one of the key nodes of the default mode network with decreased uh, functional connectivity in those that were given ayahuasca compared to placebo. Finally, psych <clears throat> psychological mechanisms of change. So thinking about um, psychology, particularly from the standpoint of personality and temperament um, in the big five model of personality, psychedelics modulate. And a number of studies have shown that psychedelics modulate over the long term these uh, thought to be stable personality traits, right? And so um, in terms of how you're gonna score on certain traits like neuroticism and openness and extroversion, at least as conventional teaching goes, these are stable personality traits that once you're an adult, they shouldn't be changing significantly over time. Yet psychedelics have been shown to decrease neuroticism as well as increase openness and extroversion. And this has been shown weeks and sometimes even several months after a program of psychedelic assisted psychotherapy. So I'm particularly interested in neuroticism, which is this personality trait that's associated with generally an increased susceptibility to stress, an increase in developing a negative uh, affect. People who score highly in neuroticism are more prone to somatizing, to developing anxiety. It's a risk factor um, for a number of different psychiatric disorders, depression, anxiety, people who score highly in neuroticism are more prone to develop PTSD after a trauma than those who do not score highly on neuroticism. And so this is been shown in a number of different studies, including MDMA, psilocybin and LSD to decrease. Um, in the MDMA studies, I think neuroticism scores were decreased 12 months after the program um, in the Lancet paper. 
Neuroticism also interestingly predicts the likelihood of challenging experiences with psilocybin. And this might actually lend some credence to those that work with psychedelics who suggest that multiple sessions of psychedelics can actually build on each other. So those that potentially might have a hard time with the first psychedelic session if they are scoring highly in neuroticism, but also if psychedelics decrease neuroticism, this might actually allow the person to make more utilization out of future psychedelic sessions if done within a, a program in a thoughtful way. Lastly, I just want to wrap up with some of the challenges uh, to implementing psychedelics and begin <clears throat> just by stepping out and thinking a little bit about the relationships of knowledge and power, which I think is important in the conversation about psychedelics. What I didn't say at the beginning, but what I usually do, is that we talk about psychedelics or some talk about psychedelics as novel therapeutic agents. And psychedelics are not novel therapeutic agents. They're not new. They've been used across many different continents by many different people for millennia. Um, so they're new to Western, to Western medicine, but they're not new uh, to human beings. And just thinking about relationships of power and knowledge and how one thing that I think is taken for granted is that certain power structures and systems of oppression have persisted into the digital age, particularly in terms of who has the power to distribute knowledge and whose knowledge is deemed to be superior and whose knowledge systems are deemed to be superior. You can see here on the left, in terms of domain names that North America and Europe and Australia, uh, despite representing only about 20 to 25 percent of the world's population, are sort of vastly uh, over influential uh, on the Internet. And the same goes in a number of different parameters. And this does have direct relevance to psychedelics. And I just wanted to introduce this concept of epistemic injustice. For those of you that don't know what this term means that epistemic injustice refers to the devaluation of another's capacity for being a source of reason or information based on prejudice, okay? And so this has relevance uh, for psychedelics in terms of the fact that there are a number of groups, including in North and South America, who have long traditionally used psychedelics, but whose use remains criminalized both in the, in the United States, as well as other countries. And epistemic injustice would say, Part of the reason for this is because of the hegemony of Western concepts. And so this is just something important to think about as we move forward medicalization. There is a hegemony, or there might be, with things like the randomized controlled trial, which isn't just deemed to be scientifically superior, but it's deemed to be epistemically superior, just better from the thought structure from which it comes, as opposed to ceremonial use of ayahuasca. So I think this isn't just an ethical issue, but it's also an issue in terms of how we might actually most thoughtfully integrate psychedelics into medicine. There may be things that if we're not open to sort of considering historical indigenous and traditional uses of psychedelics, um, that we may be actually missing something in terms of how they might benefit patients. It's a whole uh, talk of its own, but for those interested in reading more, this has been written about um, by these authors. And then finally, again, some of the challenges, I think, with uh, when we talk about a paradigm shift in psychedelics, one of the ways that it's challenging is that, at least as a physician, we're used to sort of being the keepers of knowledge. The patients come in, um, they want to get a diagnosis, the physician has the knowledge, and they write a prescription, and the patient is essentially a passive recipient of the treatment. And this really is quite different from the model that I described to you of psychedelic-assisted psychotherapy, the therapist is there to support a process, but the therapist is not there to render a treatment. It's not a prescription. This isn't considered to be a biological treatment, but rather an offering of an, of an experience which can lead to healing on the part of the patient in the right circumstances. And so I think there's a number of challenges to this, and there really are sort of competing uh, ethoses. And this is a nice article by Marianne Apostolides, who's a Canadian author. It's a, a long article, but came out a couple of months ago that's worth reading for those interested uh, in this area. And then finally, just um, wanted to give a shout out to all my colleagues at the Center for Neuroscience of Psychedelics, uh, which we opened, I think in April last year, but uh, has been long in the works for about three years and uh, perhaps more. Um, I think it's gonna be a lot of interesting research coming out. And yeah, I'm gonna take some time for questions. I'm gonna turn off uh, screen sharing, but Thank you for watching. Thank you, uh, Frank. This was, uh, as you can tell, this was a phenomenal talk uh, and a lot of questions. So I'm going to apologize in advance. We're not going to get to all of them. So let me 
I'm just going to try to lump a few questions that came up and just thinking about the notion of the spiritual effect uh, and its connection to how it relates to the clinical benefit of psychedelics. And there have been sort of a number of questions raised on how are these correlated? Is one, do you, as now that you're sort of both a, obviously a researcher in this, but as you think about the practice of this, are you looking, which one do you look at first? Are you looking at like the spiritual leading to the clinical effect? Or does the clinical effect lead to sort of the, the spiritual or and, and or how that's differentiated from the mystical? I mean, there's a lot of words being used here. And how do you define yeah. some of these yeah. words? So, I mean, I, I, I actually, I, just in the interest of time, I, I removed some slides that I was going to include in here. That, but language is, is difficult. So you have sort of mystical experience, which comes out of sort of 1960s European anthropological research versus spiritual. And, and the vocabulary does become a little bit murky in terms of what we're talking about. I think... In terms of the question that you asked, I don't think we know the answer to that, but I would presume or hypothesize that I think each one can complement the other. I think one thing that's interesting and provocative about psychedelics is that they sort of force an attention to certain domains that, you know, up until fairly recently have been kind of underappreciated in medicine, the sort of spiritual domain and just simply aspects of functioning that include meaning and purpose and fulfillment, which is related more to resilience and preventing burnout and things like that. Um, you know, so I think there's probably going to be a bi-directional relationship. One of the studies that we hope to do at MGH is going to actually look at both of these things. So it's going to incorporate a contemplative practice training along with uh, two sessions of psychedelic assisted psychotherapy. And what we're going to look at specifically is which one influences the other and how with a lot of fine grained uh, uh, psychological techniques. Right. Yeah. Um, one of the interesting um, is, is, do you feel like, you know, contemplative practices and their whole different, when we talk about there's so many, because certain practices were meant to induce, at least when we look at sort of historical context, induce certain sorts of states of being or your mind states. And do you see that uh, as you're beginning to explore this, is it, uh, is that a, do you uh, think that it might be better to instruct the patient to go through the contemplative practice first to see if they can induce a particular state and then use, or which, you know, how, how are you thinking about the order of this, like uh, in terms of the, uh, of how things might happen based on what we've done today and from historical practices? I, I, I think we're really early in what this is actually going to look like. So, I mean, I think right now we sort of have this model of psychedelic assisted psychotherapy where there's you know, a certain number of preparation sessions, a certain number of integration sessions, and then a six to eight hour psychedelic treatment session. And there could be one therapist there, which is a lot of time. There's usually two therapists. So this is just, this, this is not the model that probably we're eventually going to settle on. In 20 years when we're having this conversation, I think there's probably going to be a lot of change but what specifically it's gonna look like, we don't know. So one of the things, and that's what I think you're alluding to is how could we prepare people better? Um, whereas, you know, I, I suppose you could conceive of the possibility of making the preparation more effective, which would make the actual medicine session much more catalytic. Whereas, you know, maybe if their depression scores dropped by 10 points on the BDI without preparation that included contemplative practice, you might get a 20 point drop that lasted for four months instead of two. Um, so I think, you know, there's a lot to be explored here and we just don't know. But one of the areas is how can we make preparation more effective and how can we make integration more effective for sure. Uh, and just thinking about some of the concepts you brought up towards the end about just respecting sort of the cultural origins uh, and, and understanding how power dynamics from given that many of these things are plants or, or at least have origins in, in plant-based, uh, is there, do you have any concerns of how this may be um, uh, basically taken advantage of even in thinking about from a climate change perspective or like, you know, over production or over, you know, things from the natural environment. Any, any thoughts to that uh, of, from a, uh, you know, are we over forcing or trying to look for some of these or deforesting or anything of that sort as we look at some of where these psychedelics may be coming I, from? I see. Yeah, I, well, I mean, I think at least um, 
I think there's related issues in terms of psychedelic tourism, where there's sort of, you know, with the hype and the fact that it's, you know, people can't get these treatments here, there are increasing number of tourists going to certain places like Costa Rica and South America, including the Amazon rainforest to participate in this. And this, these can be exploitative. In terms of, you know, I, I don't think that there's going to be a gold rush on the rainforest to sort of find new plant medicines. And, and I, I think on the one hand, we should be looking at plant medicines. And my colleague, uh, Steve Haggerty at the center, actually wants to research a number of plant medicines from specimens that were collected from the Americas about 100 years ago and live in the herbarium at Harvard University uh, by Richard Evan Schultes. But this is not going to, you know, I think the idea is to isolate the active compounds and study them, but not to sort of go, uh, you know, cutting down trees and, and looking for, for new plant specimens. But Okay, Frank. Uh, uh, this you can. There's a whole discussion. I but uh, so I apologize on behalf of the orchards that are, we won't be able to get to all of them. But again, want to really thank you for obviously a very stimulating presentation. Uh, for everyone uh, in the audience, the presentation will be uploaded on the OSHA website in about a week or so. So you'll have an opportunity to review. Obviously, you presented so much content, and I think this is just the beginning. And I'll just put in a plug. Franklin will be presenting at our. Uh, uh, network forum in November on the lived experience of depression. Obviously, I imagine there'll be much more advances just in, the, in this between now and then, uh, and, and we'll have a chance to hear some updates at that time. So stay tuned for that. Um, and again, thank you so much for such a great presentation. Uh, we re really, really enjoyed this. Um, and uh, just to remind everyone, please join us next month on Tuesday, May 3rd, uh, and we're going to look at the uh, really the cutting edge research around electroacupuncture by uh, Chi Fuma uh, at the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute Center. So thank you everyone, uh, wishing you a, a wonderful day ahead and look forward to seeing you next time. Be well. Thank you.